Hi, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Crafting and Crime Daily. This is the Friday show where I do the Friday dance. Yes, I'm Rebecca, your host. This is where I recap live trials. So you have something to listen to while you're crafting. And this is now available as a podcast. So you can listen on the go. All right, let's get out of your chairs. Ready? Here we go. Friday dance. Woohoo! I gotta learn some different moves, right? Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Okay, that's it. <laughs> I am really far behind. I'm just gonna come out and say it. I am far behind on both of these trials. My, uh, I just, my heart hasn't, this has not been in it. I've got some other things going on in my life and a little preoccupied. <laughs> So I'm going to tell you what you missed on day four of the Thomas Randolph murder trial. Thomas Randolph is on trial for the murder of his wife, Sharon, for the conspiracy with Mike Miller to commit the murder of his wife, Sharon. He and his wife, Sharon, go out for dinner. They come home. They have a two-car garage. The only way to get the second car into the garage is for the passenger to get out ahead of time because there's no room in the garage. So Sharon gets out of the vehicle. She's got her leftovers from dinner that night. She walks in to the house through the garage entrance. Hubby, Thomas Randolph, he's still in the vehicle, pull, pulls it into the garage He's finishing up listening to one of his favorite songs, doesn't hear a gunshot. When he gets out of the vehicle, goes into the house, he sees his wife, Sharon, on the ground. And he proceeds to grab a gun out of one of the rooms out the hallway there. Doesn't go to her aid immediately, grabs a gun because he thinks he hears something or sees something. As he's coming out of that room with the gun, which is, and that gun, it's going to be important today with, with the testimony I'm going to talk about. That gun was a nine millimeter Makarov, which is an, it's a different sort of a nine millimeter. But anyway, he grabs the nine millimeter Makarov. As he's coming out of that room, he's confronted by the burglar wearing a ski mask. So he shoots him. Boom, boom, boom. He reenacted the whole thing for us a week later on a video walkthrough. In any case, he kills the intruder, which turns out to be his handyman, Mike Miller. His good buddy, Mike Miller, yes. The one, his male friend, that his wife wanted to have some male friends. In any case, he's being accused of grooming Mike Miller to commit this murder, and then he double crosses him. Yes. And then he walks away with all the life insurance money. And the house, he thinks, except he doesn't know that Sharon snuck off and did another will, leaving everything to her daughter, Colleen, nothing to Thomas Randolph, much to his chagrin. So what did we have on day four? The ballistics expert, which is always a huge snooze fest. But here's the most important part of his testimony. He found a total of, or they found on the scene, a total of five cartridge cases, all which came out of this nine millimeter Makarov that I was just telling you about. These four of the five cartridge cases, now the bullet is inside of a cartridge case. So when the bullet goes out of the gun, the cartridge case is expelled. And it lands, you know, the bullet goes forward, the cartridge case goes in some other direction. And this expert's going to talk about what this cartridge case did in the in this specific case. They found one of the cartridge cases just on the edge of the hallway going into the garage. Now, nowhere near where he say he started shooting him in the video walkthrough. There's no evidence that any shooting took place in that area of the hallway. It, if you look at the physical evidence, the ballistics, it all took place in the garage. And only one of those bullets made its way into Mike Miller, into his head. So this expert also looked at a 38 special bullet that was found on Sharon Randolph's autopsy. 
and a nine, the nine millimeter Makarov bullet that was found on Mike Miller's autopsy. So what this expert did was he tested the cartridge, the nine millimeter Makarov. And what they do is they, they do different tests, but one of the tests, the conclusion from this test was that once you fire that nine meter, presuming you're standing in a normal firing stance, once you fire that nine millimeter Makarov, the bullet is going to go backwards about five, or the cartridge case is going to go backwards about five feet and about seven foot over. And it could have gone farther over, except that where he was doing this testing, the wall was at seven foot. And he offered, he asked the investigator, you want me to go outside and do it? Because he knew nothing about the case. He didn't know if it was inside, outside. And the officer says, no, 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 this is good enough. So if it had happened the way that Thomas Randolph said it happened, those cartridge cases would have been in that hallway, not in the garage. So he was standing somewhere in that garage for those cartridge cases to go backwards and to the right. Yeah, couldn't possibly have happened the way he said it did. No, I thought that was really interesting testimony. I hope the jury picked up on those nuances. The next person on the stand was a investigator that had done a cell phone analysis. And he put it into, it's, he didn't use a Cellbrite program. He used some other program that batches calls together. So he took all of the home phone records for Thomas Randolph and all of the cell phone records and they ranked them. He started in February 12th of that year, 2008. And we know that on February 14th, Valentine's Day, he was given an ultimatum by his girlfriend, her me. So they did the records from February 12th to May 8th, the day of the shooting. And the number one person to get phone calls from Thomas Randolph to this other person was Liz Lavador, his girlfriend. 335 phone calls. Then there were 331 phone calls to Sharon and 234 phone calls to Mike Miller. This guy had to have been on the phone all day long, morning to night. This is an 86 day period. And they tried to do the math during the testimony. 86 day period, which is an average of 2.7 calls a day, just to Mike Miller. So at least three phone calls a day to Mike Miller. But this expert said it didn't really look like that on the spreadsheet. Some days it would be five or six phone calls. Some day it'd be two phone calls. Next day it might be four phone calls. You know, you just didn't know all over the place. But his number one boo, his girlfriend, got the most phone calls. Yeah. This is, and, it, and this expert explained, this was before text messaging. This is 2008. iPhone didn't come out until 2006. So texting was not a huge big deal. In 2008, people made phone calls. Yeah. Okay. That's how, that's all I know about this case for now. I will tell you that there was a controversy in this case brought to the judge's attention by a couple of the jurors that as they were exiting the building after the evening's testimony, they heard someone shout out a politician's name and then find him guilty. So there was a lot of conversation that took place on the record inside the courtroom, but the cameras were off and the volume was off. So no one got to hear it. So there were reporters in the courtroom that reported that this was what was going down. The jurors were brought in. They were questioned about what they heard and what it affected, you know, their ability to reach a fair decision. And I don't know what the outcome was. I'm assuming the outcome was they just proceeded 
because the trial is still going on. So interesting, though. And you, and it may have been very benign. It could have been, hey, Donald Trump, find him guilty. Who knows what they heard? But you have to explore that. You know, did it have an effect on their ability to uh, treat Thomas Randolph fairly? You have to ask. So that's an interesting thing. So now we're going to switch gears. I know. Grab your coffee. Here, this is the midpoint. <laughs> midpoint break. On this midpoint break, I'm going to show you what I finished. Craft With Me Wednesday, I, I was working on another gnome square. Well, I did finish it. Here it is. This is the back to school gnome. It's supposed to kind of look like a pencil. You have to use your imagination. She's got the apple a day going on here. So this is the back to school gnome. I think that turned out pretty cool. Anyway. Okay, so uh, we're into the holiday gnomes now. Next uh, looks like candy corn, doesn't it? <laughs> so next will be all of the holiday gnomes. I'm going to start doing some uh, Halloween ones. I, I think I counted like eight more that I'm going to do for the rest of the year. Because there's a bunch. There's two or three I'm going to do for things for uh, Halloween. Some that I'm going to do for Thanksgiving. And, and at three, four, five for Christmas. There's like a snowman and a reindeer and a Santa Claus. Yeah, I want to do them all. I do. Oh, and there's a bonus birthday gnome because my birthday is December 29th. So I, I'm going to be doing a birthday gnome as well. <sighs> I know I should be diamond painting. Let's get out the next, uh, the next color, shall we? And then we'll talk about the next case. Okay. I have really been out of sorts. I really have. And I apologize, you guys. I really do. It's so hard to be on your game 24-7. It really is. You know, because life comes around and uh, sometimes life throws you curveballs. Anyway, anyway, that what's, that's what makes life interesting? The curveballs? I don't know. Okay. So, in the case of Henry Dinkins, that's the second trial we're going to talk about. Henry Dinkins is on trial for the murder of Briesia Terrell, Briesia Terrell. She was 10 years old. She, her little brother was the son of Henry Dinkins. She was not Henry Dinkins' daughter, but her little brother wanted to, her eight-year-old brother wanted to go spend some time with his daddy. But she, her and her little brother are tight. They're like this, you know, peas in a pod. And she's like, no, no, I'm going with you. So she goes with them. And uh, she ends up missing the following day. Woke up. She's not there. That's what he said. Yeah, Henry Dinkins. So they find her. This is July 10th of 2020. They find her body August, September, October. She's found by a couple of fishermen a few months later. I want to say it's in August. But... The testimony that I listened to was the grandmother. She took the stand. First of all, note to self. Just, you know, here's one of Rebecca's wisdoms, words of wisdom. If you're going to go to court, put on a bra. Yeah. Put on a bra. Sit up straight. Yeah. Talk like you mean it. She was very nonchalant about the whole thing, just like, eh, you know, and she had the voice of a smoker. Hey, she could be a podcaster. Yeah. Do you know what I just said? That's how she talked. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I'm the grandma. So it was weird. It was, it was just weird. I'm sorry I'm making fun of her, but, you know, come on. <laughs> Seriously. Lay off the cigarettes. Anyway, okay. So she talked about how she was, she knew that her, the grandson was, you know, mom's at work at Checkers. She had called her mom, grandma, and said, hey, Henry's coming over to pick up DL, which is the eight-year-old boy. So get him ready to go. So she's getting him ready to go, which I don't know what that means. Because he didn't take anything when he went. What was he getting ready? Like, I don't know. 
So she says, while he's getting ready to go, uh, Henry comes and to pick up his son. And Briasia wants to go. And she's like, no, Briasia, you're, you're not going. And he's like, no, no, that's, I don't have enough room in my car for it. It's a small car and, you know, don't have enough room in the car. So she goes to walk him downstairs and the L gets in the car and says, come on, Briasia, let's go. And Briasia just hops in the car and goes. And Grandma lets him. She's like, oh, she went. Yeah, yeah she, she just hopped in the car and went. Like, what you say? Uh, Briasia, get out of that car. <laughs> get out of that car. I don't know. In any case, she said that Briasia is not the type of child that would wander around during the night. She didn't sleepwalk and nothing like that. She was asked, did DL ever have a conversation with you about, did he ever talk to you about witnessing his father shoot Briasia? She says, no, I wait for them to come to me, which was not, didn't answer the question. Even if you wait for your child to come to you, she goes, I don't, I don't, I don't ask him questions. I don't ask them questions about this kind of stuff. I wait for them to open up to me. And he never did. She finally added, and he never did. Because I kept thinking, okay, but why aren't you asking these questions? And I wish, I guess they're not allowed to talk about the fact that he's a sex offender. Because why in the world would you let your grandkids go with a sex offender? Especially Briasia. This is not his, her father. I would have said, no, ma'am, you get out of that car and get back in the house. I don't even, I wouldn't have even let DL go, but you know, I'm not the mommy. So very sad case, very sad case. Then they talked about a cadaver dogs, a couple of ca cadaver dogs. They were sent out the day after, like within 24 hours, they're bringing cadaver dogs out. And they take them out to this Credit Island area. Apparently, this is the area where they found some physical evidence. His dogs alerted to an area in the bushes there, but nothing was found. And he did admit on cross-examination that the scent of a decomposing body can last years, years and years and years. So... Just because his dogs alerted on something in those bushes doesn't mean it was Briasia. It doesn't mean really anything, except that a body had been there at one time or the scent of a decomposing body is there. But he also scented, and I will, I will add that that's not where her body was found, where these dogs scented. Her body was found in a different location by these fishermen. It was a location that Henry's known to be at, but it wasn't near this credit island. This whole time I'm thinking this is where the body was. No, it was found somewhere else. So they also took the dog to this RV park that was very close to credit island where Henry had his RV. And he had it parked near this little trailer. And the dogs alerted to scent underneath that trailer. So this handler explained that the wind conditions that day were such that if there was anything, any odors coming from the RV, it may have gone under that trailer. I think it's a stretch, but okay. They also alerted on the trailer, enough that it would give them a search warrant, you know, enough evidence or enough probable cause to get a search warrant. So they did get a search warrant. Then the dogs were sent over to go around the vehicles. There were two vehicles, the, the Impala, which we know Briasia was in that Impala, and a second car, a second vehicle, a, a Camaro. Now, the Impala belonged to Henry Dinkins' girlfriend. I think the, what did I say it was? The other car was... Henry's. So these dogs went around these cars and the dogs did alert to the passenger side of the Impala. 
there I put down some drills. <laughs> Let's put down some more. So then the next person on the stand was an FBI agent. The FBI responded out there and he was sent out to investigate the crime scene. So th this is their opportunity to go through all of the photographs. He executed the search warrant on the RV. They went in, they took samples of the mattresses. It was a foam mattress. Uh, they found a spray bottle of bleach, which is exactly what DL, the eight-year-old, had said. Well, he's 11 now. When he was on the stand earlier, he had said he saw his dad take a spray bottle out of that RV, and he said it was a bleach spray bottle, and that's what it was, and spray down a machete. So they found the machete. They found the machete cover. I think the, the, she, the machete was found in the trunk of the Impala. The little boy said he put the, the, the machete in the RV. But there were a lot of items taken out of that RV. A lot of items set for DNA testing and everything. So my understanding is there was no DNA from Riesia found in the Impala. And we know she was there. I, this person that was on the stand was the person that collected all of this evidence, took pictures, collected all this evidence. We haven't heard from the lab yet about what, if anything, all this evidence shows. I only know that the DNA wasn't found on the Impala because it was, that was brought up by the defense. So you didn't find any DNA in the Impala? No, we did not. You know she was in the Impala? Yes, we do. It happens. So I will continue to catch up this weekend on everything that you guys have missed this week. I still have a couple of days of both trials to get to. Also today is the continuation of the Miller hearing in the Ethan Crumley case. Ethan Crumley was the Oxford school shooter. He shot and murdered four students and injured several others. He is, it, he has pled guilty to all of the murders, but this hearing has been set up because he is a minor. And anytime you have a minor who has pled guilty or who has been found guilty of a capital offense, before you can sentence them to life in prison without the possibility of parole, you have to give them one of these hearings. And during these hearings, you get, you hear all the facts of the case, you hear anything that could mitigate what he did like what he was going through, what his parents put him through. His parents, Jennifer and James Crumley, are also in jail. They are waiting to be tried for their part in not intervening with their son's mental health and supplying him with the gun. Yeah. In any case, that hearing continues today. It probably still will not be wrapped up because the judge is piecemealing it. Two days here, one day here. But I'm going to try to bring you up to speed on what happened. Uh, this would be probably day three. I've already done day one and two, but this will be day three. It will be playlisted. And if you want to know what happened on day one and two, you can go back and listen to that first. You, you don't need to, but you can. So... <laughs> Look forward to that. That's coming. And uh, have a great weekend. I'm going to be live tonight for our event. It's, it's for the Great Escape 2023. We're going to give away another prize. And uh, same thing for Sunday. So tonight, 6.30 Central Time, 7.30 Eastern. And Sunday, 11 Central, 11 a.m. Central Time, 12 noon Eastern. Be live both of those days. I hope to see you there. If not, I'll see you in Crafting and Crime Daily on Monday. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone.